Hey everyone, my name is David. Welcome to church number 19 of 52 churches in 52 weeks, round three. So as you can tell, uh, this is a little bit of a different look uh, this weekend. I had a little extra free time with the 4th of July weekend as I filmed this. And I decided that with the extra day, I had a little bit more time to travel. One of the next steps I wanted to take on this covenant path after my personal baptism, after confirmation and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and then to do the Aaronic Priesthood is, now I have a limited use temple recommend. Now I can go inside a temple to do baptisms for the dead. As I film this with 4th of July weekend, I decided, you know what, let's, let's do a little bit further of a drive. Let's go to Nauvoo, Illinois, especially after I went to the Kirtland Temple just recently. So the Nauvoo Temple, this was the second temple to be built by the Church of the Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, Joseph Smith kind of came up with the plans, but, on, but as the temple was being built, Joseph Smith was killed and martyred in 1844. And when Brigham Young took over the majority of the Latter-day Saints, one of the interesting things is he, he told the saints to continue to build the temple. And even as they were getting uh, driven out of Nauvoo in 1846, Brigham Young still wanted the temple to be completed. So they were able to do baptisms for the dead and other type of ordinances. So a big part of me when I learned about this history was if you're, if you're being driven out of this area, you need to get out or else be killed, why finish the temple? So as I have been kind of going down this new path of mine with the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, part of me with a historical perspective and part of me just as I con the conversion part of me, I really want to do my baptisms for the dead at the very first time in Nauvoo. So to I'm about to walk in in a little bit and I'm excited, I'm nervous, there is just all types of emotions and, and part of me too like i don't know what to expect but i do know what to expect i talked with my missionaries last night just to kind of get an idea what what to do give me a little bit of a game plan and they really helped me kind of formulate what to expect what to bring what to say um, they told me to call ahead to see if i could have someone uh, kind of um, give me as a first timer uh, kind of walk with me and just kind of take me through because again I'm, I'm excited but I'm very nervous to do this so I'm about to walk in I'll, I'll bring the camera with me up until the door I think so you can kind of get a first uh, a first person view of what I'm going through before I walk in so I'll be back in a little moment uh, to kind of share my personal experience uh, with my first temple experience. I'll give a recap what was going through my mind inside the Nauvoo temple for the first time in a little bit. Um, afterwards, I had to sit uh, with a number of thoughts that were coming at me from all kinds of different angles. Uh, it's been over a year since I made my very first temple open house visit, then as a lifelong Protestant, and like I had to review that video just to kind of remember some of the thoughts that were going through my mind because to go from then and fast forward to now where I converted, got baptized, became a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, to see so much change ha and happen over the course of the past year still kind of blows my mind. Um, I, I went back and rewatched some of my thoughts from that first Temple Open House visit. And the thing that I remember most that really stuck with me was this sense of the Twilight Zone. Because here I was going in for the first time inside this sacred space before a dedication where the temple is usually, um, you know, reserved for its members. And like the, I wanted to have a certain sense of reverence, but because I wasn't asking anyone any questions, I was just kind of touring and just walking around, I didn't really understand the full scope that the temple represented. Here's the thing, though. Everyone around me 
championed what the temple was all about. That's what was really different to me. So as I was contemplating this twilight zone where it's like I feel like I'm walking into the twilight zone, there was a strong sense of, no, maybe I'm walking out of the twilight zone as I'm going into the temple. It was such a complex and profound feeling because the world right now represents so much chaos, so much distraction. And I, I recall from members at that time kind of explaining that the temple was this sanctuary of peace. It removed distractions. It was this place that you could focus on Christ, on Heavenly Father, and just have this serenity and this peace within yourself. And that was that was really interesting to hear. As even though I didn't get much from that first temple open house visit, um, everyone around me, again, that champion type of mentality of example, because everyone around me, it's just like there was so much focus on Jesus Christ, the family, and the church. And all three of those components worked together. So to see the example outside of, you know, so many Latter-day Saints dressed in their Sunday's best on a Saturday night, and just to see the, the energy, the excitement, and the example was something that I could not ever forget. And afterwards, I just had this, this feeling of holy envy, so to speak, because it was the temple was just held in such high regard. And afterwards, I, like, I couldn't stop thinking about it. And it was just so different than any other worship center or any other type of church setting that I had ever been a part of. So I wanted to learn more. So I had it. So I did more temple open house visits, and, and you know, with Manti and Saint George and Orem. Um, I, I there was just so many profound lessons that I was taking away from each different one that I went to. I may be going on a little bit of a tangent here, uh, but uh, with other temple videos I've done in the past, uh, usually I would try to consolidate my experience into one word. And I feel like the one word from the Nauvoo Temple that I took away from this experience was sacrifice. Uh, I, I feel like in today's world, we live in just such a selfish generation where individual happiness is the ultimate goal nowadays. So, I mean, you don't even bat an eye in today's day and age when it comes to divorce or singleness. And it's, it feels like the family institution has really taken a back seat. And it's the concept of marriage being elevated to an eternal marriage with eternal families, uh, as it is within the theology of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, still kind of blows my mind in today's world. Because, and, and the thing about that is, is to create a family, especially eternal family, like a big part of that is sacrifice. And when I made that first temple open house visit, and I see all these families together, all the smiles and everything that was going on. It, I think a profound type of thought I had at that time, and maybe I couldn't even express it back then or communicate it, was this the church's shared vision to build something together. The church globally would build something together for all its members, for all its families. And a big part of that to do that was sacrifice. Uh, in that video, I kind of talked about some of the uh, Protestant views I had back then of temples because the LDS versus the Protestant view of temples was just miles apart from a theological perspective. Because when I thought of temples back in the Old Testament, uh, you know, I was kind of taking this from Adam and Eve. When they sinned, God has to find an animal to basically sacrifice. At that time, I kind of figured with temples, it was more of a way to sacrifice the best of what you had from an animal perspective to atone for sin. And obviously the ultimate sacrifice was going to be Jesus Christ. So when the atonement with Jesus Christ, when he died on the cross, 
resurrected and ascended, everything was set. There was no more need for any kind of temples. And Paul kind of talked about how like our bodies have become the temple. So like I never saw any reason to have it nowadays. I think over my the past year, some of the things that really started to press on me was the importance of covenants and to have, and not even term it that way. I didn't even know what a covenant was a, a year ago. I wasn't even sure on that, but I could see the, the need for a promise with Christ because otherwise, if you just keep sinning, repenting, sinning and repenting, and you don't have anything accountable for that, it leads to this this toxic relationship and if like if you're dating someone or if you're married to someone and you know they just keep treating you poorly like what's what's holding you together like well your vow of marriage so how do you not have a vow with heavenly father or with jesus christ so that started to play with me and why the the need for restored gospel was so needed. I was listening to an interview not too long ago, and the guest brought up N.T. Wright. Uh, he's this famed biblical scholar, and I understand he's actually going to be visiting a church not too far away from me in a few weeks. So I got tickets. I'll make a future video on his work in a few months. But the guest mentioned that N.T. Wright basically said that the kingdom that Jesus preached lives within us. So with the restored gospel, it emphasizes transforming the world that we live in right here, right now. And it just kind of got me thinking about if we are disciples of Christ to enact God's work, like we need everyone that we can possibly have help out on this. So with the temple, like it is this recentering it is this way to preach to all the nations, this global church. And a core aspect of that, to do that, is through sacrifice. Let's get to the temple experience. So first off, the purpose I was there was for baptisms for the dead. When I first started hearing that term, um, it just sounded so different. So I also heard, uh, especially in the past with temple open house tour guides, the, the term used proxy baptisms. So I just prefer using that term. So it wasn't a long experience. Uh, so I'll just share maybe a few steps inside, uh, but more so maybe just what was going through my mind uh, as I was taking these steps. So uh, the night before I had talked with my missionaries, so I took some of their recommendations. Uh, because I was going solo, I, I had been advised, uh, you don't really need to worry too much about setting an appointment just to be safe, um, I tried to do it online, but I was having some difficulty with that. So I called ahead to the Nauvoo Temples. I think it was their front desk, just to let them know that I was visiting for the first time. This is going to be my be my first temple work. Um, I remember the the receptionist, you know, kind of just mentioned how excited she was for me, and I asked if you know if I could have someone kind of guide me through this for the first time, uh, since you know I. I you don't know what you don't know. So even though I had known a lot, especially what to expect from a visual aspect after attending so many temple open house visits, and then also being made aware that it was going to be very similar to my own baptism, I felt comfortable from that perspective. Still, before walking in, as you can tell from the earlier part of this video, uh, my nerves and excitement were, were through the roof. Like I would probably say even more so than my actual baptism. I, I was worried that my Protestant brain would kick in just due to the newness of everything. I think I was concerned that I would either feel confused or challenged or, or just unsettled about some things. And that never happened. So I like to think that just due to kind of game planning this with my missionaries, um, doing the temple open house visits in the past, and just having conversations with people just kind of helped remove uh, any type of barriers that I may have had walking in. So when I walked through the front door, I was greeted at the reception desk by just a fantastic staff in all white. And again, this is where the newness uh, kicks in for me because I had never seen 
men in all white suits before in person. I was trying to think if I'd ever seen that at a wedding with the, the groom wearing all white, and I don't think so. I had seen pictures of President Nelson and the First Presidency and the Quorum wearing all white at temple dedications and also in front of uh, the Christus statue. But to see it in person, that was new to me. I, was, I let them know, hey, this is my first time doing proxy baptisms. I may need some help. And a, a gentleman uh, took me towards this chapel room. And I'm so glad that, you know, you get to go to the chapel room first because I remember thinking to myself, I was going to pray before I walked in. And just due to probably my anxiety, my excitement, my nerves, I forgot to do so. So with the chapel room, that's a great area just to kind of recenter yourself and just calm yourself. Um, one thing that I remember was this burning sensation inside of me. I was feeling extremely hot. And it's probably just due to me being in the car filming earlier, but I just remember just heating up inside. So we walked out and one of the volunteer staff members gave me a print off of five names. I originally had a few ancestor names in mind, but um, I'm kind of glad that I didn't bring those up, just again, due to the newness of everything. Um, also, I had the assumption that I was just going to do one just to get literally get my feet wet. Uh, when I was given the print off of five, I'm like, you know what? Hey, let's let's do all five. That's this is fantastic. I'm here for this. So I uh, went to this desk to get my size changed out. And then we walked out to the baptismal font and to see this particular one absolutely floored me, just absolutely beautiful with the 12 oxen with their backs holding the baptismal font up. So another staff member kind of guided me where to sit. Uh, he paired me up with another gentleman um, for who was going to assist me. Got to witness a few proxy baptisms and then it was my turn and we did five of them. So when I walked out of the baptismal font, I was given a towel and was about to change out. I think I had a lot of adrenaline going at that time, uh, especially just with the sensation of, you know, the water. But I remember when I walked out, um, I had two big sensations. One, that heating up, burning up sensation had completely lifted. Um, I just remember this sense of removal. And also there was this sense of human connection because we always talk about so much about loving thy neighbor. I've never loved thy neighbor for someone quite who has passed away. Uh, that was a different experience for me, very profound. And I don't even know how to communicate that quite so much because in a way with the 12 oxen holding up the baptismal font, there's this sense of those that came before us who carry their own backs for even us in this generation to even be here at this time. For their backs to carry us, to give back to that was an interesting feeling. As for tips, if you're a first timer going inside a temple, I went in solo, I would not advise to do that. A friend invited me to attend the temple with him for my first time, and just due to timing, it didn't quite work out. Uh, after the Nauvoo temple visit, uh, I had a group that I went with at the Provo City Center temple, and that was much more comfortable with people that I knew. So if you're going in solo, I would advise not to for your first time. Also, um, I had some names of ancestors that I had in mind, and I didn't bring that along. In hindsight, I'm glad that I didn't. I think for the first time, um, again, it's just it's better to focus on learning and just kind of see how everything works. And I might have been distracted and not really appreciated the significance uh, of my direct ancestors. So if I could give any type of two tips, that would be mine from this visit. After this temple experience, uh, I've had to sit with and mull over a lot of thoughts. And one of the, the themes, I think, at the forefront of my mind as I've been doing this has just been that idea of sacrifice, uh, especially to kind of take my Protestant way of thinking before with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ where temples were no longer needed, and then to have modern temples and what sacrifice means now. 
Um, if I could get deep for a moment, um, and, and this is hard to admit, but at times I have felt hesitant as a recent convert to attend the temple. And part of that is just due to the distance. But I think for myself, and again, this has nothing to do with the church or the members who've been absolutely amazing and just the outpouring of support and love. I can't say enough good things. I think for me, it's like I, like I had plans for this year and I've just had a number of setbacks um, to give me some feelings of I'm not good enough. And it's, it's strange just how the, the mind works and the outside distractions and chaos can impact your own spiritual life. And as a result, like I have felt that is trying to attack my conversion process through the temple. So as a result, it's like, like when it comes to the temple, there's those feelings of inadequacy where it's like, I'm not good enough. I don't know enough. I'm not ready enough. I'm not prepared enough. And as a result, like I, I can feel inadequate and stuck in a lot of ways. And if you're watching this video, maybe you feel the same way. Maybe there's things going on in your own life where you feel stuck or things just aren't going the way that you had planned. And even as I say all this, I know it's the mind working tricks. I know it's just doubts. And it's frustrating for me to even entertain these thoughts where the mind is chipping away at your confidence. Even when I did that video uh, attending the sacred grove and I see a, a red cardinal bird, my you know, my calling card, so to speak, um, during this spiritual process at Hill Cumorah, and then this internal shout in the sacred grove of stop doubting, the fact that this still remains uh, can be frustrating. One thing that just started to just print and imprint in my mind over the past week has been the story of the boy with five loaves and two fish. And like, you know, the story goes that Jesus, he's, he's, there's this huge crowd. He's healing people. It's getting dark and Jesus wants to feed them. And the disciples just see this as being impossible, right? And, and Jesus is persistent about it. So they find a boy. He's got a basket, five loaves, two fish. This boy does not have enough. He does not have enough bread. He does not have enough fish. And yet, he offers it to Jesus. He sacrifices this to Jesus. And it's not enough. But Jesus took that. He was able to use that. And he was able to multiply that. So I have been thinking about this story ever since my temple experience. And I'm trying to just draw parallels from that story to my own conversion process, but then also to the early Latter-day Saints who probably didn't have enough either when it came to building the Nauvoo Temple in the first place and just the tension and the persecution that they were facing and the fact that they were able to complete this to do ordinances even after the death of Joseph Smith, uh, that spoke volumes to me as I kind of took away some of the historical perspectives from this. I think if there's anything that I learned from this experience, uh, even though I may feel like I'm not good enough or I'm not prepared enough or I'm not ready enough, I'm gonna offer what I have. And whether that's knowledge or understanding or grace or humility or five loaves of bread and two fish, whatever it is, whatever sacrifice that you offer, he can use that and he can multiply that.